guys so much for this lovely introduction. And it's my honor to host tonight uh, my mentor in uh, gastro diplomacy. And I also think I have to update the bio because the dates a little bit uh, were wrong, but that's on our end because I sent that to Charlie and, you know, that was just me not being paying attention. But um, uh, I heard a first of gastro diplomacy, right? When we started a dinner called This Place Kitchens, which allowed refugees to escape poverty through food. The dinner quickly went from a small, you know, series, 10 people seated dinner at Mazesh in the lower side of Manhattan and grew sh uh, surely to become, uh, it fed over 10,000 people and it was adopted uh, by multiple organizations around the globe. And then one day, as I was walking down from 96th Street, I get a random message on Facebook from Professor Johanna Foreman. And she was inviting me to come down to speak at her class where she taught a very interesting class called Conflict Cuisine at American University's Grad School Foreign Service in which students learned about conflict and cuisine. And then I learned uh, a bit more about Johanna's work. She was previously also at the Justice Department and she was responsible for uh, fighting against uh, dictatorships in South America. And she also was heavily involved in the food space around the globe. And she really is a cornerstone of the modern form of gastro diplomacy. And through her network, we were able to uh, go with the State Department and the Stimson Center and the uh, Sype Center to Turkey, where Professor Johanna launched a project called LIFE, that basically was an incubator kitchen for Syrian refugees and Yemeni refugees, uh, women mostly, to work along with Turkish women and men. Um, to launch food businesses. The idea was very simple. It was basically like a WeWork situation. You go and you learn how to launch a business and they give you a commercial kitchen and you scale up. The project scaled up to multiple cohorts and was also opened up a secondary output in uh, Izmir, which was a key city because that was the city that a lot of refugees were jumping out of Turkey into Europe and walking. So the idea was to give them a life, which is what I call the life project, a financially secured life through that work. And through her uh, work, I learned a lot about this, uh, the Gastro Motiva movement, which is a movement that was started by David Hertz in Brazil, and it encompassed uh, global chefs around the world, including uh, Jose Andreas and, and many people, and Johanna is a key player in that. And she gave a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, presentation at the MoMA Salon uh, about gastro diplomacy, which I think she can share with you here. But to begin, thank you, Johanna, for joining me and, and the students. And it was such a surprise to learn that you were an uh, iHouse alum in the 70s. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that before we jump in? Well, first, uh, Nasa, it's always great to share a stage with you. And Siesa, uh, I'm so happy to be back at my old digs. Uh, I think I could tell the grant, joke about Grant's tomb, but then I date myself to how long ago it was. I bet many of your students don't even know that Groucho Marx's favorite question was who was buried in Grant's tomb. And I remember looking out my window the first night and seeing Grant's tomb when I was there as a graduate student, and I had to laugh because there I was. But it's a very inside joke, and if you're a millennial, you won't get it. So I won't say any more. Uh, but Nas, thank you. Um, I want to make a few little uh, additions. Uh, I was at the State Department and USAID. I did work at the Justice Department also since I'm also a lawyer. But um, the thing that brought me to this field was that I really believed we were not making a lot of progress on many of the intractable conflicts that developed after the uh, Berlin Wall fell and we came into the area of proxy wars. And tragically, uh, today, there are 14 intractable conflicts that account for 60% of the world's hungry. And I think that's a really sad statistic, especially as we go towards the sustainable development goals, which we are to achieve by 2030, and the chances of doing that are going to be very hard. But um, Nas has always been an inspiration to me, too, because he epitomizes the entrepreneur. Uh, I read about him actually in one of the uh, media, uh, food media in the area. I think it was either Eater or one of those uh, magazines. And I said, I have to meet this young man because what he's doing is exactly what I wanna do. He is putting into practice the kind of work where he brings together uh, refugees and immigrants in New York City and he has them prepare a meal, but also talk to people who are consuming it and creating what is important. 
uh, commensality, coming around the table and using food as a way to bring people together and to talk. So I always thought that that was great. And once Nas came to my class and he spent about two hours, I think there, and then we talked and talked, uh, you know, we've become good friends and I've watched him grow in his career and do all kinds of exciting things now with the migrant kitchen during COVID. But I'm sure he'll want to tell you a little bit more about that. But let me just do one thing because I am an academic and I feel like that prerogative. Uh, you know, gastro diplomacy is really a form of public diplomacy. And many of you are probably familiar with culinary diplomacy, which is also another form of public diplomacy. But the difference is pretty simple. Uh, culinary diplomacy is a function of the state. It's what governments do. Gastro diplomacy is what we as citizens do. And I think that is what differentiates it and makes it something that is so fascinating because it's evolved into many different forms. Uh, and I think I'll leave it at there for now and we can talk and you can ask me some questions, Nas. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yes, for sure. And uh, just on a uh, secondary level, I just want to say that uh, one of the per personal things that I love about working with Johanna is that she's like my Jewish mother uh, and I'm Palestinian. So we definitely talk a lot about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and how we can also resolve that with food. And uh, I, she introduced me to Joanne Nathan and there was a very interesting story at the time. Joanne, which is considered one of the celebrity chefs of the 70s, she's, she runs for the Times, she's friends of Johanna. She talked to me about cooking a meal with a Palestinian woman in Jerusalem right before the Yom Kippur War and she lost in touch with her. So we went on a mission to uh, get contact with this woman and, and we didn't do it, but that was uh, a memorable thing that, you know, this is the kind of cohesiveness that we can get in terms of gastro diplomacy. So just to begin, uh, Professor, I remember when you did the MoMA Salon, you mentioned that the core of gastro diplomacy really started at state dinner. And uh, they had to teach Nixon, for example, on the flight on how to use chopsticks. Uh, you mentioned that during the form of the Obama administration, uh, there was a lot of tough talk and it was only after lunch was served that a breakthrough came about. Uh, so the idea of breaking bread, talking about very difficult situations, right? How can that lead in as a part of the policy toolkit to solve real world issues, like you know the immigration issues or the refugee issues or things like that? So how how did that come about as a form? Did it happen by accident and then it became an art, uh, or was it planned? Well, oh, I think that's a really interesting question and we probably need to spend the whole evening dealing with it but um you know i think you know that food and breaking bread is an ancient way for people to come together so we know that when you come around a table we're just coming out of the easter season we're going into ramadan now on you know in another week uh when you come around a table with people you usually don't fight and so that is important. Franz Kafka said, you never fight when you have food in your mouth. And I think that's an important thing to remember. But uh, there is a whole effort to use food as a tool of mediation. And there's even a term for it now, gastro mediation, where people are using their different foods, which is something that is part of their cultural DNA and using that as a way to bring different groups together. Uh, in London, for example, a NGO called International Alert had a project on uh, food where they brought refugees in London to uh, prepare a meal that would be a symbol to them of what a meal for peace building would look like. And they would make this meal and they would discuss why this meal meant so much to them. So you probably are familiar with this food, mansa. Uh, which is, I know, a food that is eaten in Syria, in Jordan. But what I was told by the chef who made that meal, and I read her recipe, is that in her household, when they made mansaf, it meant that they were coming to some resolution of some dispute with a neighbor, with a friend, with a family member. And the fact that it used yogurt, that its color was white with the lamb also had symbolism. So. I give Bye. You Thank you, everyone. Hello? Anyway, uh, to go on, I mean, that's just one example. 
No, I think that's a. I think you're talking about the word sulha, which is basically, I guess, what King Abdullah right now is doing with his brother over Mensaf. I hope. Um, but in general, yes, like at weddings and at funerals and at definitely like real hard situations where where one tribe was, you know, hurt by another tribe, they will definitely break bread over Mensaf. Is considered the most uh, expensive meal to make and, and things of the sort. So it's definitely an honor to do that. But I just want to take it back into the, the state level. So when we decided to do a life project, how did the State Department say, okay, like Turkey is a big destination for food. We know this. People go for food tourism all the time. Where did the idea of building a kitchen for livelihood as like funded by the government, an international government, mind you, it's not the Turkish government, right? Uh, became a solution or like how did this, how was this brainstormed? Well, I think the project you're referring to, which was implemented by the Center for International Private Enterprise, was funded by the State Department in 2017. And I was approached by that organization because they had heard of gastro diplomacy. I don't think they really understood what it was, but they were looking for ways to find a positive form of engagement between Turkish men and women and Syrian men and women who were in the country of Turkey. Turkey has the largest number of Syrian refugees. Um, it's, it's officially between three and a half million. It could be closer to four million. But the point is that often there was not a lot of good rapport between the two groups. And the thought was if you could use an entrepreneurship program this might be a way to bring two groups together, even though the languages were different. Uh, one thing we know about cuisine in the Levant is that there are recipes that are very similar. The flavors are similar. The spicing is similar. They're not identical, but certainly the power of the Ottoman Empire across the Middle East influenced the kitchens throughout that area. And what we learned in the training of people is that once people who were Syrian started through translators talking to people from Turkey, they realized that the common bond they had were recipes, that they made similar dishes. They called them by different names. They might be some variation, but it was a way to start talking not about their differences, but about their similarities. And that's a first step towards understanding the humanity that food brings to people. I mean, I totally agree, and this is actually what happened here uh, in response to the Trump administration uh, on the travel ban, which became later known as the Muslim ban. Uh, one of the way that people were resisting against uh, such a ban were having uh, dinners uh, curated by refugees, which is how we met through displaced kitchens. Um, our model was a little different, as you know. It wasn't just about storytelling; it was about storytelling and making an ask at the end of the dinner, which allowed us to like get this refugee not just to share their story, but like get them housing, get them a job. Uh, and we didn't even know that this could be a thing. It just, it happened once and it worked out. I'm like, oh, can we do it again? Can we do it again? And it, it, it translated. But then after seeing what happened with the, uh, the life project and having those dinners together, this was really at the core of the migrant kitchen, which, you know, like during COVID fed, you know, over 2.5 million meals, 18 US cities, Beirut and Jerusalem, by having migrants and refugees really cook a uh, disaster relief organization food. So basically taking that and just putting it on scale. And uh, we are now currently at iHouse. I don't know if you know if I told you this, but the cafeteria is at iHouse and our team it cooks uh, the, the student meals there. But with that said, how can we take policy thinking or policy approach in the series of gastro diplomacy and implement it? So we did this all like on the micro kitchen on one end, but are there any other projects that need to come to life from this concept that we haven't seen yet? Well, there, there have been many projects, I think, that have arisen throughout the world. Uh, I see people on this call who are working in Guatemala, people who are working in Colombia, people who are in Turkey, uh, that are working with their communities. And it's interesting, but a few, I guess it was last week, I was on a program with uh, some academics and the briefer was from the Central African Republic and she was with the World Food Program. And one of the things that she pointed out was with all the problems of governments, the one phenomena which was positive in the Central African Republic was that the communities were taking solutions into their own hands. 
They were taking the need to share food, the need to help harvest each other's crops. They were working at a level that was really important. And I think that all over the world, especially in the developing world, we know that communities have better answers than their governments. So the lesson that we can take, and we know this from what you did in New York, uh, Nas, during Ramadan last year, when you found that many of the mosques did not have a way to deliver food to the elderly or the infirm, and you took over that delivery service. So once again, it was a community response, not the city of New York, but the way people recognized through the their own communities, through their own religious groups, how to work. Which really like the point that I wanted to drive to is that like at the end of the day, I don't think personally that the private sector has all the answers, right? But neither do the public sector have all the tools. So with that said, how what is the intersection of public and private to align the interest in order to serve the community? And for a long time, there was this clash between the public and the private, right? We see it within our political system, we see it within our thing, but there are, like food in particular, at least with gastro diplomacy, is when high macro level policy thinking was executed with private enterprise or you know private companies, um, lean and very efficient kind of execution, which led to grand results. And we need more of that, right? We need more of that in the public health sector. We need more of that in, in the food sector. We need more of that in, uh, education sector and, and, and so forth. But if we are to uh, set an example with that now, uh, given that everything that's happening, I know that the Biden administration is considering putting on a food czar ambassador of some sort or things like that. I know Jose Andreas was uh, lobbying for it with the New York Times uh, op-ed, at least saying that we need one. Um, how do you, do you see the future being good in terms of like the food security space in the United States? Is it going to be like that globally? And how can we encourage private enterprise to come to the public sector and say, hey, we have these resources, can we work together? Well, I do think that this pandemic, which has been a global public health emergency, has demonstrated how much we need to work, not only at the community level, but with the private sector, because we're not going to get out of this if we don't. I mean, governments have a very important role. We see what the role of government is in the United States in helping to provide subsidies for individuals so that they are not going to starve to death. Many countries don't have the benefit of a safety net that we enjoy here in the United States. So the resources are going to have to come from the community or the private sector. And you're absolutely right. I think there's greater recognition over this last year, how important it is to come together with different business interests, because at the end of the day, if people aren't working, there are no consumers. And if there are no consumers, then they go out of business. So there is a uh, circular need to support each other. And I believe that is becoming more and more of the case. Now, we have problems in this country with race, with identity. But on the other hand, I think one of the nicer uh, collateral benefits of this period is that there is a recognition of the tremendous variety of different types of foods, of different types of chefs, of different types of cuisines, all of which have come out during this period. Uh, to take you back a second to your class, right, which I honestly think is one of the most important classes. I only got to sit in it well on but you know, I've been looking at the curriculum always. Uh, you recommended that I should get a book called Dinner with Churchill, in which Churchill really divided up the Middle East over a dinner table. Mm -hmm. But the, the question that I have for you is that how do you approach teaching conflict through food? Like how, um, give, can you give us an example on that? Maybe Latin America. Um, I know like you worked a lot on the issue and you lived in Colombia. So like, is there anything that you can shed light on that? Well, I mean, first let me say that in terms of approaching conflict to, through food, Washington is known for all the restaurants that opened during the Cold War because we were the place that people could emigrate to. And our, we had a senator who said, you could always tell where, was, where America was at war by where the new restaurants opened. And it's still not true today. It's not as obvious because of the nature of immigration policies, but in fact, it is true that most cities 
if you look where the new restaurants open, you can tell where the last conflict is. And I see, I have a colleague from Turkey, but she'll verify for me that in Istanbul, for example, there are Uyghur restaurants now because there are Uyghur immigrant, immigrants in Turkey. So I think it's really interesting to see wherever there's been a conflict, you'll find a restaurant. Um, in Latin America, and I know we have lots of participants tonight from there, um, when I worked in Colombia, I was just looking at some pictures the other day of the, in the state of Tolima, which was one of the most conflictive areas during the conflict uh, that finally ended in a peace accord in the mid 90s. But I remember going to restaurants in the most br brittle uh, conflictive zones and still actually being able to break bread with people. I didn't know if they were part of the FARC or part of the conservative groups, but we sat there and we ate dinner and we shared a cup of coffee. Uh, so there is this concept of the dinner table having a safety zone or being a safe space. And I think that's important. You see it in your own area in Palestine. No, for sure. But I think it also like, uh... This, I mean, as, as, as grand as this, as this uh, subject is, it really comes down also to uh, smaller things that people care about. Like, I know, I remember at one point people were like, oh, I don't want conflict chocolate, right? There was this uh, craze about the fact that, you know, there was a lot of slave labor happening in Ivory Coast and things like that where they were importing chocolate. There was also uh, a documentary on Netflix about how the cartels are trading in avocado when the drug routes are down, right? So there are all these little nuances that sometimes when we hear about them, they blow our minds. I mean, we don't think usually about food as a political thing, which I think is a very privileged thing because food is very political. It is. Yet food is the most shared thing on social media. I mean, we discovered when we were talking about the Syrian crisis that if I put a plate of hummus versus a refugee family has been displaced, I can talk about the refugee family through the plate of hummus more than the actual picture of the uh, the refugee family. And also people take food very personal, right? And, and, and which we talk about all the time with the hummus wars. Who has better hummus? You know, no, who owns hummus? You know what I mean? Like, and, and and it becomes a thing. And we, I think we all agree that nobody should make chocolate hummus. And maybe this is at least the common ground that we have. Gastro-nationalism. <laughs> yeah, gastro-nationalism is definitely a thing. Um, if we talk about Ma'lube, for example, which is the, the Palestinian cuisine, um, uh, you know, at one point, I think Haaretz claimed it Israel's national dish, and then it became a, a whole frenzy of another another layer of the conflict over, over this one particular dish. So I think, yes, uh, you know, gastro-nationalism is probably more imminent in your face than gastro-diplomacy. But gastro-nationalism, like all nationalism, could be toxic, right? right? Yeah, you can get a sense of pride, you can get a sense of, but it also it gives you racism. Nobody wants to talk about that, well, right? But diplomacy breaks those barriers. And that's how we need to keep, keep going forward. I think food is a personal matter, but it also identifies us with place. And when all you have, when you're disp displaced, when you're pushed out of a country from a war or a conflict, is you have your food. And it's a connecting factor. The other thing that you know very well is how do we learn about other cultures? Well, if you you're a millennial, I guess, until this last year, you could travel. But we all learned about food through our palates, how we tasted food. And so that was the first exposure to different cultures. I and completely agree. I mean, when I was in a restaurant in New York, I couldn't afford to travel. I was a, I was a poor immigrant going to a, a, a city college, you know? How did I learn about Puebla and, and Mexican food was through the cooks in the back or, or Guatemala or Bangladesh or what have you. I remember when I worked at Dallas Barbecue, uh, which is not really the best culinary experience ever, but nonetheless, uh, in the in the back of the house, there was a lot of like Bangladeshis, Latinos, African Americans, Africans, and they were everybody during Ramadan, Muslim or not, were in the restaurant for the whole day. Um, can we uh, mute? Yeah, thank you. So. Um, this is how I got to experience this, the type of cuisine. And I think you mentioned something really important about conflict and war in DC. I mean, we, have an, we had an explosion of Ethiopian restaurants in DC and even the Simpsons made an episode about it. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you go in DC, there's an Ethiopian restaurant like at every corner. Right. So migration also plays a big 
big factor in that. And, and Detroit, for example, with Middle Eastern restaurants, uh, LA with Persian restaurants, I mean, it got to the point where they're calling it Tahrangelis, right? And you have the Armenians on one side, right? And in New York, of course, you have uh, the Asian community, which is now completely under attack. And they're talking about how to save Chinatown, right? Which is also part of what gastro diplomacy between people to people. Right. We all have to become food ambassadors for our own culture. And that not only means sharing it among our you know, people who are similar, but sharing it with others so that they understand how wonderful the food is. And uh, you know, food changes when it crosses borders for sure. And I think that's also what makes it interesting and more unique, that food is not a static phenomena. It evolves, it, you know, it has all kinds of manifestations based on what's available and what's, you know, what you want to put into your meal. So that's also very interesting. Uh, so on this, Kind of like last time before we take questions, do you remember your um, best meal that you had at I House when you were a student? Oh. Uh, was there good food in Harlem at the time? You know, I was so busy as a graduate student, I, I don't really remember, but I do remember that the Upper so West Side of Manhattan did have wonderful restaurants. Uh, it had Hungarian restaurants. I'm sure they're still there. I had my first Palacinta, which was a crepe on I think Amsterdam Avenue, there was Cuban Chinese food in Harlem because the, in Cuba, Chinese immigrants, as they were brought around the world, built railroads, they built them for the sugar plantations. And so I remember that the Cuban Chinese cuisine was something that I really enjoyed. And I think it's still uh, something that is a feature on the west side of Manhattan. But New York is a strange phenomenon, but to get back to what you asked me originally, when I taught my course, uh, trying to teach about conflict and re refugees and migration, I believe this course could go to any city in the United States because every American city always had a Chinese restaurant and always had a Mexican restaurant. And yes. even if you only had two cultures, you could teach your students about what migration meant. And clearly there are many, many more today, but the point is, that you can combine the geopolitical with the gastro diplomacy with the use of taste. And let me just add one point before we go to questions because countries from a geopolitical point use their food to brand themselves because they have something unique. Mm -hmm. so for example, Thailand was one of the first countries to use its Thai cuisine as a way to show the world how interesting a small country could be with its own global cuisine. This was followed by the Peruvians because the Peruvians also recognized that their own Andean cuisine with all the varieties of potatoes and corns and spices could become something very special. So nation branding, which is like any other branding and advertisement was a way of attracting people to visit, to promote tourism and trade. And you know, we all live in a world which is a global food chain. I think there are only 34 countries in the world that are not self-sufficient in food, and yet we all depend on other countries for our food. And this use of food to brand a country and to make it unique is a very important phenomena in international relations right now. And it also was revenue. About, can we talk a little bit more about the Thailand situation? Because like that's how Thai food became Thai food around the world. You know, people. So like it was through micro loans. And I remember also the Belgians at one point uh, in the 2000s were going on the same thing too, by giving small loans to uh, the people that started the waffle trucks, the Belgian waffles around New York City. And there, uh, and there was an expansion of tartines, yeah. I don't know if in Washington, we had Turkish co coffee trucks, I think that were promoted by the Turkish tourism board. But there are countries around the world are branding themselves. And the other part of that branding is that UNESCO, which is the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, does recognize food as an intangible cultural property, prop, which is something that even further legitimizes the way that food can be used as a diplomacy tool. So there are many, many ways that countries can promote themselves. Uh, if you're not a, you know, one of the big P5, or you're not the other 13 that sit on the Security Council, 
and you're trying to distinguish yourself in the world, a cuisine is not a bad way to do it. And you can also trade your products as well. So it has tremendous benefits economically for a country. Absolutely. And expands tourism, which exactly. Thailand, I mean, boom yeah. tourism. Yeah. You know that from your experience in Morocco. Oh, I mean, Morocco, it was an interesting experience because the Americans, you know, in the Arab world in general, the Arab world consumes more meat than it produces, to your point, that we need, you know, some countries are not self-sufficient. So the New Zealand, Australia, and Spain, and the UK always sold halal meat. The Americans never did. So finally, the Americans were like, okay, we're going to enter the halal, you know, meat business, lamb, chicken, and beef. But the way that the Americans enter the business is almost like, yeah, we're going to flood the market, right? And then when we were brought on to have a conversation with them, we're like, wait, 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 you can't do that because that looks off imperialist and stuff. And there was this cartoon of a big muscular American chicken beating up a little Moroccan chicken. <laughs> and that's the only thing that they can talk about in terms of like, you know, we don't want this, right? And there was also this whole like uh, public rumor that this chicken is filled with uh, hormones and, and it was bad for you and whatever, right? Which was not true. So we decided that we should take a social impact approach. And I remember going with the uh, American embassy in Rabat, which wasn't assigned an ambassador yet at the time. And we went to the uh, ML group, which is the recent award recipient from Gastromotiva. And it is a, a women owned kitchen that allows women who escape sexual trafficking or poverty to use food uh, and sell food in this restaurant that TripAdvisor supported and, and the State Department supported and what have you. And it became a hot thing in Marrakesh. Um, so you can have real, real impact by using trade because trade is going to happen anyway. So if we're going to do that, might as well do it with impact rather just with policy wonks and and, and a profit, uh, you know, for like big conglomerates, you know, a, a small company like us or a small group of people can influence the way the decision is made and therefore the impact that it can have on the population. Maybe it's time to take some questions. We've been doing all the talking. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So, uh, the, would the program's office be? Yeah. I don't know. Willing is the program to office read the questions? The Q and A. Yes, uh, it looks like so far we just have one question. Oh, that's good. Uh, maybe folks will join in. Um, question is coming from Nazmi. What tools do you think refugees and immigrants have when they arrive into Canada and the U.S. that help them build and extend their cultural identity? Well, I think Nas and you can answer also, but I think. There are lots of programs that are available in both Canada and the US that support refugees. Uh, once people get here, I don't wanna talk about the whole turmoil of getting here, but I know that Canadians have very generous programs. I just read about uh, a group Singa, which uh, has kitchens, which help women entrepreneurs in Canada. In the United States, if you go through the list of uh, organizations around this country, which is large from Seattle, Washington, to Maine, to New Haven, Connecticut, to New Orleans, there are kitchens that have been set up to help entrepreneurs uh, use their skills and uh, sell their food. So even in our own city, Washington, D.C., which is not a city, we're not a state or a federal district, we have uh, charter schools that train immigrants and give them all the tools they need to be able to go and work in restaurants. And it, until the pandemic, this is something we all have to think about, having a job in the food industry was not a bad job. Paid a livable wage, it was hard work, but certainly people who come to, you know, from another country are willing to work hard. So I think uh, there are plenty of programs. The problem is what happens if you don't get into some of the countries that have safety nets, the Germany's, the United States, the Canada's, uh, the European Union. I, thank you for that, actually, and this is be something we have uh, first-hand experience in. You know, a lot of people are like, why don't we have programs like Canada? Why don't we have programs like Canada? Um, and I think Canada is a little bit too extreme, right, in the sense that, like, they have the 13-month problem in which refugees are completely catered for, catered for in the beginning. At least this was like three years ago, maybe it changed, but what ended up happening is that um, they were, 
uh, so handheld that by the time that like, they needed to do it on their own, they couldn't do it. In the United States, we have the opposite of that, the complete extreme opposite of that, right? Where like they only have three months to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest problem is the allocation of those refugees, right? So if you're in New York City and then you land here and you only can get like $400 a month, you're not going to make a living. You're going to end up homeless on the street. So there has to be um, some sort of like economic metric based on the skills of this individual on which states they need to allocate them in, which I don't think happened, which is why the space dinners or the space kitchens came about, which also speaks volumes to the fact that here at the end of the day, you can land in JFK. And if you're savvy enough and you speak the language, you can download ways. And you know, if you have a thousand bucks, you can start driving an Uber, right? Which means that you start making money right away. I mean, of course that's in theory. And there is a sense of like conscious capitalism to this. And I know everybody hates that term, but there is that thing. And that is the benefit of being in the United States, right? So every refugee that we worked with was able to not only get a job and pay off their debt or, or whatever, but they were able to like find financial security through work or through uh, housing or through employment. But there are still are problems. Like for example, they owe the ticket that, they, that brings them here right? That's a debt they have to pay. So they're already in debt. That's a problem. Two, like you don't get enough financial stipends so you can get on your feet. So there is always that risk of like, I don't speak the language. What am I going to do? You know, I'm going to become homeless. And these are real problems, right? So it has to be somewhere in the middle. It has to be like a hybrid. But what I'm really excited about is I think that we as a society, consumers in particular, right, have become and grown more conscious. So therefore businesses need to start making conscious decisions on how to behave with these kind of situations and they must allow for uh no barriers of entry in certain industries and the food industry is one of those industries where you don't have barriers to entry you can just become a waiter or a cook and i know i did it for a, a good number of years for over a decade right so with that said it there has to be some sort of like the, all the pieces are everywhere and it takes sometimes an individual or a company like the micro kitchen that to bring it together with the help of johanna but I think there has to be some sort of a playbook that every company can do this and every government can do this. And with that, we are able to create uh, enough change in society and respond immediately to large scale problems. Okay, great responses. So the next question is coming from Ness. Thank you for this great event. My question is, in your opinion, is gastro diplomacy an instrument performed only people to people, or is it a tool used by governments to influence other publics? Thank you. So thank you for the question. And that's exactly the point. It's used by both people to people, and it's used by governments as a way of promoting their unique values or their unique cuisines. I think we mentioned it a little earlier about nation branding as a very important tool for promoting middle power presence uh, in the world. And uh, what's always interesting to me is how the Thai government uh, did a very clever thing and made loans available to its expats, to its people who were living abroad, if they would open a Thai restaurant. And to this day, they started that in 2005 and we're uh, 16 years out. And if you go around the world, you'll find Thai restaurants in every corner of the world that you travel. And it's a testimony to that program and to people who want to promote a certain cuisine. So uh, yeah, I think it's a very good idea. And that coupled with the UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Intangible prop, uh, Property type of uh, programs are very successful. I would like to answer the question uh, by, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing correctly, Kinja or Kasinja, Kasin, is that correct? Uh, she asked if you can you recommend a few cookbooks that feature refugees. I would like to say that Professor Johanna Foreman has a cookbook, well, technically her organization does, but The Life Project, you can buy it on Amazon, that is only refugees from around the globe uh, showcasing their food in this very easy, very great aesthetically looking uh, cookbook, which you can get. Uh, and she can share more details on that. Uh, 
we're not here to promote products. The cookbook was about Turkish and Syrian. <laughs> they, had, they did ask. They did ask. Right. So that's all and, I wrote. Uh, it is coming. available. It's called The Cuisines of Life. And yeah. I'm one of the co-editors with a Turkish woman and a uh, Syrian gentleman. Uh, the Turkish woman's name is Phyllis Hosokoglu. And the Syrian gentleman is named Ala Alatori. Al but the book is available on Amazon. And if you're in Europe, it's on the British website, CKBK, which is a cookbook website. Mm -hmm. And soups for Syria, I see somebody wrote that there are one of the things, and I recently wrote an article about this, is that the number of cookbooks for refugees that has appeared since 2015, which is when the first major exodus of uh, Syrians came about, is just amazing. There are about 35 books that have been written and on the commercial market. But I think people forget the reason why cookbooks are important. And that is, you know, if we're going to enjoy the food of other cultures, we have to have a roadmap of how to make it. And cookbooks serve that purpose. Many people carry recipes in their heads when they travel from one country to another, and we can't read their minds. But what we can do with a cookbook is have a well-documented methodology so we can recapture what other people make. And a good cookbook, if it has recipes that are tested, will allow us to enjoy the cuisines of other cultures. So it's not only the beauty of a cookbook, but it's the ability to capture and learn something from another culture. And let me just add one little fact that the United States government in its refugee resettlement regulations requests that the repatriating organization or family make a culturally appropriate meal for the family that is coming to them. So cookbooks have a very important value. If you're resettling an Afghan refugee, you wanna know how to cook something that's appropriate for that family. And cookbooks are very important. There've been articles written about it, but I do think it's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Also, could gastro diplomacy be used as a form of activism? And absolutely, I was, someone looking for a revolution, there was no revolution to be had, so I made hummus. <laughs> so you can definitely do that. Right. So, Siesha, other questions? Or have we tired everybody out? <laughs> I think we're just getting a bunch of comments. People are saying, uh, thank you. Sidia says, wonderful, thank you. I am working on a cookbook in Toronto. Featuring oh, cool. 80 nationalities and another one about my refugee flight from Bosnia. Mm. Uh, she thanks you guys for the talk and the work that you do. Uh, uh, there was another question about Palestinian cuisine. How can we distinguish it by Nazmi from Syrian Lebanese? And I got to tell you that I hate that because we're all one people. Now, it is true that we have uh, gastro nationalism, which tends us like, oh, this is Palestinian, this is Lebanese, this is Syrian, but every kitchen is different with the Syrian being the most diverse, the Lebanese being more popular and the Palestinian being the most resistant. Uh, and that is in itself a uh, different kind of context because when I talk about Palestinian food, if you try Palestinian food, if you are Palestinian, then it's very authentic, very traditional. Changing one thing becomes this offensive uh, thing to the pop because it's all about preserving culture, culture that we lost after 1948 and then later after 1967 with the Six Day War. So we hold a lot to our identity. And similar with um, uh, textile, with the Palestinian film, the, the, the embroidery that was still being around, while the rest of the uh, like Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, which also had embroidery kind of like evolved in fashion and things like that. Uh, also, you would notice that a lot of Palestinians probably own Lebanese restaurants because it's just the most popular thing around. So yes, we do need representation in North America with Palestinian cuisine, but that cuisine has to be executed properly. It can't be just a falafel hut. You know, people now, they want different tastes. They want to be proud when they go in. They want to go to a nicer restaurant. They want to have the wine. They want to have good executed dishes. They want to have good service. So it can't be just the name and the cuisine. It has to be the entire execution of it and also taking the risk to open a restaurant. And I can assure you, I do not suggest anyone should open a restaurant unless you want to lose everything. So don't do that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be out of your mind. But if you decide to do that, then at least do it the right way. Invest the money, 
and invest in the execution and the chefs, and then you will have it. And I'm happy to report that uh, Daniel Dorado, who's the co-founder of the Migrant Kitchen, helped, this is a Mexican, helped a Palestinian chef, Tariq, open up a Palestinian restaurant on 23rd and 9th called Kanoon, which yesterday was reviewed as one of the best 38 restaurants in New York City at number 10. So if you are there, please go and check it out. Uh, and you'll realize that sometimes the best Palestinian cuisine in Lebanese or Syrian is not even cooked by Lebanese Palestinians or Syrians. It's just some Mexicans who know how to, you know, do the palate correct. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, it's coming from Daniela. What is your take on ideas like culinary fusion, where the particularities of each culture are somewhat erased to create something new? Well, I have a particular view on fusion because I think that cuisine and food is evolving. Even when the minute you take it out of the country that it's cooked in, and you transfer it to another place, you've created some potential for fusion. Now, I mean, there are chefs who do incredible things of combining Asian cuisine with Mexican cuisine. We all know about the Korean tacos, uh, but I do think that uh, the way food moves across borders, it is borderless. And you are always fusing new spices, new tastes, new flavors, so uh, we are eating fused cuisine, even if we uh, don't want to admit it. Um, and I think that's my own take. I don't know how you feel about it, Nas, but- uh, I mean, the micro kitchen is only based on, on fusion, but not fusion in the, the tacky, like, <laughs> let me show you a picture on Instagram sense, right? When we started the migrant kitchen, uh, the idea was to cook cuisine from all over the globe. So we had WeWork as, a, as one of our clients and we would serve lunch every day. And we were like, okay, these three locations are going to get Cuban. These three locations are going to get Mexican. These three locations are going to get Indian. And we were like, that's kind of like bullshit and boring, to be honest with you, right? Mm -hmm. so we have more interesting conversations about food and the dishes that we invent from these conversations rather than just cooking cuisine in particular. So the Migrant Kitchen, which got reviewed um, with the equivalent of what would be a two-stars pre-COVID uh, and made the top 15 restaurants for three months in a row um, on Eater, uh, it really infuses Arab Latino cuisine and where I take the entire Arab world or Mina and I infuse it with all of South America. And the number one dish on this menu is a pastalon mahshi. Now mahshi is stuffed zucchini or stuffed grape leaves, which also the Turks and the Greeks make. But we did we took it and we put it in a, in a plantain, which is a very Dominican thing, <laughs> or a very Colombian thing. And we topped it with seven, sp uh, with seven spice on Ras al-Hanout, which is the Moroccan spices and, and tahini and whatever, and it became the number one dish. Um, so it's things like that, I think, that can invent new things. Fusion for the sake of fusion is bullshit, but <laughs> fusion for the sake of innovation of what a new cuisine should be or a new dish should be. I think works. And one of the best things on that is a book called The Flavor Matrix. Mm -hmm. It's a book where they plugged in every food known to man into IBM into Watson and looked at the RNA of food. And they built a, basically a matrix that can tell you what works together. So we always know that um, chicken and pomegranate go together and chicken and chocolate go together because that's why mole. But what turned out to work is that chicken and apples go together, right? And we, matlube, which is a Palestinian dish, just usually made chicken with eggplant, actually tastes better with chicken and apples. And of course, I did that once at a dinner and I almost got my head chopped off. But nonetheless, it worked and it was delicious. You know, it's just that you have to be innovative in that sense. Yeah. I guess that wraps it up, yeah? So thank you guys so much. Thank Professor, thank you. It's an honor to be, to share the stage with you and again, and uh, please, guys, if you're able to look at the Momo Salons, she has an excellent presentation there. Follow Johanna on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And I hope one day you can come teach a course here uh, at iHouse or in New York, because I'm pretty sure a lot of students who study foreign diplomacy here would love to be part of Conflict Cuisine. Well, thank you, Nas, for including me tonight. And thank you, C.H. for bringing me back to my old dorm. A pleasure. <laughs> That's even more impressive that I could get back virtually today. And thank you for all my people who are online and willing to stay up through dinner. 
or in some cases through the night, since I see somebody's from Turkey and up through the middle of the night there. So thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good evening.